Welcome to the December 6th Open ZFS production users call. We have John D.W., Levi, Stu, Greg, myself, Michael, and of the many possible topics, one that has come up between at least three of us is ACL compatibility on ZFS because there is the elephant in the room windows and on Illumos FreeBSD and Linux, you get several options such as POSIX ACLs, such as NFS v4 ACLs and friends. So I believe, Greg, you said you were taking this on for the first time in your career. Do you have some insights to set up set us off with? Um, well, uh, so we have a, uh, the ZFS server here, and uh, we moved the project over to it because our uh, proprietary storage vendor storage server is is uh, getting too full, and they want to run a project off the uh, ZFS file server and see how that does. I've been trying to pitch them to use this instead of proprietary solutions. Okay. And um, so the the vendor that we have here is Cumulo, and they have a really elegant way of deploying Windows permissions. And uh, we, for security and auditing reasons, we have to have AD groups where only certain people can access these shares. And then within those, this project, there's financial data, which has to be more restricted. So basically, I just started this morning looking at that um, on how to do it. And that's what I'm working on today for the very first time. And I seen this pop up and I decided to join today and listen in and turns out to be the topic. So we'll take is something away from it. All we can hope to achieve such that okay. first off, are you on Linux, FreeBSD, Illumos, or one of the other many OpenZFS platforms? It's the, uh, I inherited a, uh, a, um, sorry, a core. Um, a TrueNAS core system? Yeah, the Linux uh, variant. Uh, we oh, do have scale? a yeah, yep. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Okay. And we do, yeah, and we do have the uh, core and B free BSD, but that's on, that's for uh, near line backup storage. Got it. This storage here, um, and the reason why it's Linux, if you want to hear about, it, I actually the first meeting I joined here, I uh, mentioned this. Um, we bought a Dell server. Yep. And, and I went out and I bought a LSI HBA and uh, and the petabyte of storage and i plugged the hba into the dell server and it refused to boot and i posted on the free bsd forums and here there and everywhere no one had a good solution um so i tried the linux in a just install and i said all right i'll just run with that then hmm. um yeah but um uh, this storage we had installed what's called a, a honey badger card and it's a nvme Card. So we have uh, two of those in, and they each have uh, um, eight uh, one terabyte NVMe drives on it, and we're using that for special devices and and uh, log. So make make sure yeah. your your heat sinks. Are you new one here? Honey Badger. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I was warned about that. And um, yeah. So, anyways, uh, it, that is kind of geared i guess to uh, be able to, to handle production loads and this is going to be our first go at it and if it's successful then i'm going to buy another server and a rsa license for ha and set that up and that may be the go forward for the company instead of buying very expensive solutions like cumulo wants about 70 or 700k for uh, two petabytes and Goodness. I can, yeah. And I can buy two petabytes for a hundred thousand or less. Um, uh, yeah. I can get you a Viking J bot for <laughs> yeah, exactly. less than that. No kidding. Um, yeah. so quick under, question talk, about talk, those NVMe talk, devices. Talk, yeah. <laughs> oh. Someone is either got, is either jumping in or has background noise. I'm fine. If you jump in, <laughs> um, does that NVMe device give you four devices or does it like unify them in some wild bifurcation? There you go. That's the question, bifurcation. No, uh, so uh, there are two autonomous cards and I got one in the slot that goes to CPU one and the other that goes to CPU two. And um, when I was making my V devs, I was taking one from each just in case 
you know, some catastrophic happened sure. in the back plane or yeah. So um yeah, that's like uh the only thing that's a little inconsistent is the uh, special devices. Uh somebody mentioned to me that I should use a triple mirror instead of a double mirror. And their logic was well, if something goes wrong on one side, you, you have maybe a split brain thing where they don't know which drive actually has the right data but i've since learned that the checksums that you guys do and whatnot that's not entirely true at least that's what i believe it to be but anyways there's uh, a triple nvme of uh, special devices how interesting okay yeah the and one you thing see them sorry. each discreetly correct yes yep. okay got it yep. so, well, yeah uh, the, the one thing that sorry uh, that I want to ask here, maybe at some point, maybe not for today's topic, but uh, for the log, the slog, I used the NVMEs and, and they're one terabyte, but I was hesitant to partition them because I know I only need like a couple gigabytes of it. So I want to see if anyone had any opinion or insight onto if it's best practice or okay or acceptable to partition a device to use for a slog. And then use the rest of it for, for cash, L two arc or something similar. Uh, one, I've definitely seen well, people uh, do that. Go ahead, others. I've I've Chris, kind of. Does my audio work? Was Chris, that a question? Chris? Yes, I, yeah, I hear you. Yep. Oh, sorry, I had some problem with my Bluetooth. Okay. Uh, that's why I'm late. Uh, I. Sadly missed the beginning, but uh, for S-Log, I found out that partitions are fine, but S-Log is used to uh, reduce write latency for uh, durable writes. So if you put load on that device in a meaningful way, you potentially raise your, uh, especially the tail of your latency distribution quite a lot. So NVMe potentially, in theory, with very good firmware, you can have two namespaces and different submission and completion queues per uh, namespace on the device. Uh, I haven't had the chance to test that in real life, but if the performance you get despite the uh, shared queue depth uh, is good enough for you, then go for it. It's not a risk for durability's sake, so you're not risking your data. Uh, you're only risking your basically write latency, and you can fix that if you can re rotate the data to another device, you can recover if it turns out that it was a mistake. Um, what is a good idea, in my opinion, is to uh, have a erased partition so that the rear leveling of the SSD knows that this space is unallocated and it can use it for better rare leveling because as you get close to the capacity of the flash, your rare leveling starts to require more data movement. And that um, is where a lot of the uh, latency tail or red latency comes from on SSDs. So just basically over committing your uh, non flash to a higher degree uh, helps a lot with reasonably uh, quality SSDs to basically turn the affordable SSD into the equivalent of the five drive rights per day uh, allocation, which sometimes really same flash, just different firmware configuration. So uh, that can help. Uh, certainly Optane has been killed by Intel. The later Optane server drives were great for affordable yet very low latency for short QDEP, uh, yeah, S-Log devices. And that's no longer an option uh, unless you have some lying around and want to give them a last hurrah. All right, so before we go too far down, Greg, you mentioned this is for financial data. Oh, no, sorry, it's a M and &E. Media and entertainment, oh, okay. but, but there's a folder within the project gotcha. folders. Okay. Yeah, I only heard. I um, sorry, I I got confused. Go ahead, let him finish. We're t we're talking, you know, proper video. You know, yeah, we models. we do uh, VFX work. Okay, so yeah, yeah. if you're doing 
So if you're doing GFX, lots of small files versus monster, you know, video archives are the tuning is different. Um, when, yeah, well, most most of our files are uh, are quite large. I just actually did a uh, here. Just give me two seconds there. I guess, again, again, yeah. your GF are your GFX pre-render or post-render or both? Both. Okay. Yeah. I actually set up two different tools, different setups with different tunings to handle that. Ah, right. Okay. So what so, on two different data sets or yeah. Two yeah, different okay. two different physical pools that have different attributes set and then different spaces underneath each one of them for different projects. Interesting. Yeah. Can I'll, you I'll... describe the number one difference between those or two? Like block uh, record size or something? Uh, record and and um, how the cache is tuned. Okay, thank you. To go back in my notes, but I've got a master menu of what we've worked with before. And it goes everywhere from itty bitty little ones to you know, the, the large rendering houses. Mm -hmm. um, one question, depending on your file formats, it may be possible to get the best of both worlds by using special allocation classes, because then you can have basically the big block allocations come from different uh, VDEFs than the small block allocations and metadata allocations. So you could use something like lots of SATA SSDs in a JBOT and NVMe uh, cards for the smaller blocks and not have to basically partition your data logically, but just physically. If I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken, you can tune it to drop all files of a given small size into the special metadata class, even though it's not metadata. I could be misreading that, but yeah, not files, but block allocations up block to allocations. block size. Fair enough. So you could say blocks up to 32 kilobytes go to the NVMe flash. Yep. And uh, you allow it to make use of one megabyte blocks on the pool. Uh, for a flash pool, the write latency for a one megabyte block shouldn't be too bad. And the other thing is, your VFX work may be special while it's lots of smallish writes if you write out each frame as a single file, for example. Uh, but those shouldn't be synchronous writes, immediately at least. So if you share, for example, via NFS, your storage, and then you have the window where your server has a chance to catch up and write out via the buffered arc, to the actual location without having to go through the s lock device if it uh, basically cleans the buffer before the NFS commit message arrives. Hmm. But uh, yeah, there, there are so many knobs to tune. <laughs> yep. And that said, uh... And that's, John, go ahead. that's exactly why we split them into different pools so that we could do start turning knobs without impacting things both sides while we were working through that with them. So that's, and, it, and a lot of it depends on, you know, the software that's utilized, how much prefetch they can do, how much they can handle. Yeah, there's a, and the networking cannot be understated in this type of thing, Greg. So just, <laughs> I'm sure you've thought about it, but I've seen the network crash before ZFS would. Well, yeah, or uh, during the Christmas break, um, we're deploying a new uh, 100 gigabit core, and um, we're I'm buying dual 40 gig interfaces for this server. It only has 10 gig right now. I may buy a uh, 100 gig. Not sure if that's overkill or not, but but the 100 gig is actually cheaper now. Really? Yeah. If, yeah. If there's not a big difference, then I'll just go to 100 gig because we'll have ports for it. Do you have a switch ecosystem of choice? Um, I, we bought Dell switches this round. Um, when I so I just took over a, a position uh, for a startup company, and the guy before me made a lot of uh, less than ideal choices. There's basically not any any two switches from the same vendor in our network right now yeah 
and because we we're buying our servers from Dell, um, and I've used Dell switches before, so they they're the ones that uh, bought FastX, I believe the company was name. Uh, what was it? Uh, FastX, I believe it was. Uh, there was a switching company that I used when I worked at the HPC for the government uh, in, in our HPC environment, and um, they acquired that company, and uh, they're basically rebranded just to Dell, so the technology is still the same, and, and mm -hmm. I knew that they're good switches, so I just was happy with them. Um, I don't like Cisco switches because they're always a little bit behind, I, I found. Um, yeah, so it's a uh, it's dell switches that we're using i mean i know that there's lots of other vendors out there that would meet the bill and whatnot but we already had a relationship with dell and their their payment terms were um yeah. in favor with what the company owner wanted to see so oh don't assume anything i'm just surprised i hadn't heard dell and 100 gigabit in the same sentence before but that's cool. <laughs> yeah yeah it finally happened oh did it okay but, but yeah. wait there's more you can have a big switch onto your Dell order. You, you can oh, what? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you can add a hundred gig switch to your Dell. Oh, all oh, right. Yeah. Sale there <laughs> on each order. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, dude, you got a Dell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Up to four hundred gig. There we go. Go yeah. Cyber Monday but, uh, savings. Go ahead. <laughs> one thing, uh, which was also worth playing around with, Force is. Uh, cool. Get a good uh, NIC like Connect X5, X6, and then uh, take a look at their offloading engines. Because I uh, think FreeBSD has full support for their uh, TOE engines. So that could also help a lot. Just so that your networking stack doesn't uh, blow up in your face. Mm. But with Dell, you have to watch out for what works in their devices and it's blessed. Right? So not force him, uh, no, no. Sounds right. Is that the NetBSD one based one from the good old days? I believe mm -hmm. it was, yeah. That's actually the, uh, the whoever pasted that Dell link, that's actually the switches that we got. That's cool. Yeah, that was what came up yeah. in my search. And yeah. that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> We don't ask Levi and I about looking for a, a simple gigabit switch in 2023. We thought that was a solved problem, but yeah, not so much. There be dragons. <laughs> okay, anything else relating to small record or tuned record sizes for specific applications? And feel free to share any wisdom that is not like exclusive company IP that can't leave your data center. Uh, Sometimes because... your big uh, blocks are worth the right amplification because they get you better decom uh, better compression ratios for databases, for example. If you have to read every Postgres database with a bunch of indices, you can sometimes fit four or five times as much in your memory uh, by just enabling Z4 compression with a 128 or even one megabyte block size. Yes, it costs you write latency and even a bit of write throughput for the read amp uh, sorry, write amplification, but uh, being able to fit four or five times the working set into your uh, ZFS arc can more than make up for it hmm. because suddenly you can afford the server where your full database fits at least compressed into main memory and you are no longer doing any read operations for your joints from hell. Yeah, but in databases right there, Michael, too. <laughs> it's specific, but it's yes. very much against the older recommendations. Um, Do you have any example blogs or otherwise or links about that? Uh, some posts on the FreeBSD file system and hackers mailing lists uh, okay. back these claims up and I've encountered them myself. So cool. Circling back to ACL models for those who have crossed operating systems, do you have any sort of good, bad, and the ugly stories? Um, I, well, we're dealing with, uh, with that right now. So, uh, 
were SSD, uh, SSSD, the uh, name mapper on Linux and other systems. It comes up with a hash uh, to, to map to AD SIDs and on every OS like uh, uh, BSD versus Linux versus uh, OSX, they all have a different algorithm. So long story short, uh, we're going to stop using that and we're using AD attributes, uh, specifically UID number and GID number as the attributes. And we're going to point everything at those so everything has a consistent uh, view of, of uh, ownership and whatnot across multiple Unixes. So that was one of the things that I'm, uh, I've been dealing with. Uh, again, over the uh, Christmas break, we're going to be yeah. doing a big recursive change on and whatnot in the system and flipping to that. Because we've been hitting other issues too, aside from the cross Unix thing. Um, there's also a lot of people are in more than 16 groups and that's a legacy limitation of, of NFS and groups. So uh, some people have been breaking or unable to access areas because they're in more than 16 groups. So using the attributes is supposed to address that as well. So you're, so you've got your, okay. So you've got SSSD, Samba and NFS all trying to deal with the same piece or are we just doing it the NFS side? Um, it all access either happens over uh, SMB and, and there's a few people like the producers and other non-artistic people like the administrative staff, they all have Windows machines. And then there's a couple artists that do because of Photoshop and other Adobe things. So there's only a few of them, but we still have to give them the same level of access and restrictiveness that everyone um, has. And the rest of them are NFS, but we do have Apple and we do have a couple of different uh, Linuxes as well. And um, to, so, to make, sorry, go ahead. Um, the question on the SSSD side is, mm -hmm. do you have the enumerate to true or to false? The uh, mapping? Yeah, in the SSSD config. Yeah. If, yeah, there's there's a map. Sorry, go ahead. If go enumerate ahead. set to false, the ID mm -hmm. should be consistent across platforms on who's accessing it. I will look into that, but the 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 way that I've done it in the past, there's there's another um, attribute in there. It's called uh, uh, map to. Let me jump on a machine here. Uh, Cat Etsy SSD. Well, LDAP ID mapping. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah so if that it. if that's set to false, it will use the attributes that are defined. Oh, see, I do it the other way. I do LDAP ID mapping is true, and enumerate to false. And, enumerate to false. Yeah. And I get and I get the SSIDs from Active Directory. Map those in my POSIX controls on my on my ZFS and Samba configs. I will look into that. Um, I, I ran into this problem at another shop I worked at and the way we, we got around it was was by using the attributes. You, you just add a couple of attributes and point things at that. It's like a GID capital N U M B R and yep. yeah. So um, it also that was just it depends on the Active Directory version you're running running to. Yeah, I think ours is uh, 2019. Yeah, 2016, 2019, and 2022 should all be the same, responsive wise. Yeah, they don't have the. Uh, I'm not a big Windows guy, but um, they don't. The version that we're using doesn't have the Unix services option anymore. Right. Yeah, but the all of those with SSSD should provide you a consistent um, DUID under the covers. Yeah, it sounds like they both kind of achieved the same thing maybe. I, I don't know. I, I'm gonna look into what you suggest though. Are either of you connecting FreeBSD clients? We are not, no. I, I connect Linux, I connect various Linux, 
other Linux clients, as well as Macs and Windows systems. But no FreeBSD? I don't have a FreeBSD system in my Okay, no worries. I can make one really quick. Oh, if you could, uh, at least two of us were up till three in the morning battling this with SSID and trying to connect against the 2016 system we want to update, but we need to back it up before we update it. So it was an adventure. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll spend one of those on my phone. That would be awesome. Yeah, share what you got. Because um, in the broader scope, if you catch the recording from two or a few hours ago on jails and enterprise working groups in FreeBSD, these things really shouldn't be that painful to onboard with. So we hope to all put our heads together and document the right way of doing these things. <clears throat> yeah. Now, okay, uh, please, I suppose, share any and all recipes, and that's fascinating about enabling and disabling. And Jan, you shared in chat a Red Hat password protected paywall Blah blah blah. No, thing about enumerating it's just, I just had to click away the cookie warning. Really? I'll try that. Okay. For me, I it's subscriber exclusive it. content. I don't know. <laughs> it just says that for performance reasons, you uh, should disable enumeration. Uh, it's old, but it's still in the knowledge base. Because enumeration requires you to to walk the subtrees uh, in uh, LDAP. Right. Levi, you got all that? Yep, starting to piece it together. <laughs> and one uh, that's, painful that's lesson I can share with regards to anyone not using Active Directory, but open LDAP or another Unix LDAP server is to never ever use groups of names, always use groups of distinguished names, even if you have to update the schema because the normal schema uses group of names. But if you do use group of distinguished names, you can use the member of overlay to get uh, the re reverse relationships auto-generated so that they cannot get out of sync. So that you can efficiently check which members in which group by having the LDAP server um, materialize the inverse of the member relationship. I think they actually added that to the sum before cookbook. Yeah. That can be, it has been a few years since uh, I decided I don't want to use LDAP and want to keep a local replica. Uh, but yeah. Do any of you have go-to uh, documentation on these, or is it just a question of long hours, pain, suffering, scars, and a lot, lot of the alcoholism? Go ahead. Internal notes and liver disease. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, share what you can. Yep. Uh, I will. I will gladly work with you to get it in the right public places. And you know, at best, some of these things hit blogs, and I found a promising blog that's only accessible from a Google cache of a, of a snapshot of it that may have answered what I'm after. But it's like, really, is this is this what our industry is, is down to? Yes. Uh, Wayback Machine is your best friend. I know, I, except when it isn't. Um, wow. Oh, yes. The most annoying case of that was then, uh, I fixed this in an update, and then the update article wasn't cached by Bingo. yes yeah go here <laughs> this is replaced by this content and then yeah memory hole yeah wow. the first website i ever put on the internet is on uh, the wayback machine Wait. yeah it's like walking down memory lane and i, I can't believe i gave up the domain name either it was uh, fqdn.com oh well yeah. didn't realize <laughs> Yep, still not loaded. I will drop this link here because they actually used all the right words. So like, okay, here's what TrueNAS Core is doing. So here's what we're doing with ACLs. And I put, that's what I led with in the notes there. Um, yeah. And are they correct? Well, I don't know. Maybe. Are they correct uh, with the next update? I don't know. Maybe. 
anyway. Maybe get in touch with someone at TrueNAS. You may know how, how well, to get in touch with the right people. That would be uh, Andrew. And uh, yes, of course, uh, Alexander joined the last call and gave that great overview on the recent issues in 2.2. So, oh, totally. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, try to convince them to produce a rough brain dump, which someone else can then clean up and give them for review? Uh, one must make sure it's in their best interest to do so, but yes, I hear you. I hear you. Maybe if they can be convinced to share their knowledge, but then this can become default behavior that thoughts will have these options maybe enabled by default and stuff like Correct. this. Okay, we've given those two topics quite a bit of attention. Any others? Have you updated to 2.2 something dot something, perhaps dot two, to avoid the potential issues surrounding block cloning, which is described nicely in the last call. So catch that on YouTube if you haven't. But uh, Alexander Moulton gave a great overview about how it was a perfect storm of, a, of various issues that came together and re revealed with OpenZFS. So of course, OpenZFS looks bad for several unrelated things, some of which predate its inclusion in OSs. Anyway, I said it. Other topics. Mind you, I am never against a short meeting especially one that covered ground like that. And I know there's some gems in there about simply these attributes, false or not false, enumerate true or false. Love it. I'll let you know how I make out. <laughs> that would be great. Please do. Well, uh, speak now or forever get back to work. Yeah. More emails send. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, everyone, I'm going to call it, but let's, I can be around a few minutes and thank you so, so much. I do look forward to any notes you're willing to share on those recipes that work because we're all in this together and you want to back your data with OpenZFS. So let's please make that as accessible to people as possible. There, I said it. I agree. Yeah. We're, um, I'm going, I, I just got the approval to buy another uh, petabyte of storage. So, I am going to be researching how to, I understand now that you can, I can add more VDEVs to the existing pool. Um, so that- How many a, devices are you talking about? Uh, we many? got, yeah, there's 86 or 85, 86 drives in the chassis. Um, mm -hmm. And we're buying, and we're buying another chassis of 86 drives. Nice. If you don't mind, where is is this Super Micro or some other vendor? Seagate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That scale for non random read write, maybe large enough to justify look at D read. That's a good Your point. D. But if I switch, I was, I was just, I just watched, um, oh, I'm having a brain bird here. The, the guy at Clara Systems, uh, mm -hmm. that, yeah, that song. Do. Alan, yes. Yep. I just watched a, a presentation the other night that he did on D-RAID. And I was like, uh, maybe I should have did that. But um, I'd have to tear apart the array to, to implement that. And there's like a petabyte of storage on there already. So well, yeah, you're doubling yeah. capacity. So you're in a position to do that. This is true. You ship it all over to the other for a week or two and then go forward. Oh, awesome. That's, that's, that's an interesting idea. Maybe I'll... But, uh... The advantage of D-RAID is that it basically the spare capacity is sharded across all disks. So basically you get the IOPS of all disks all the time mm -hmm. because you can think of, of it as uh, kind of like partitioning the disks and then doing a rate, parity rate across the partitions. So that <coughs> every disk is in every role and that you lose the ability to have dynamic stripe width so if you have lots of tiny blocks, that's a terrible idea, which is why you mostly want to pair D-rate with a mirror for the metadata. So you yeah. Put, and then you... it makes sense yeah. because at that scale with 180 or so drives, 
you kind of have to expect the, one of them to be degraded every once in a while, mm -hmm. maybe two at a time. And then with D rate, you have much better performance during reserve rain. The yep. answer yeah, is they yeah. just reserve rain doesn't do the full integrity check and you can basically only grow by full JBots. But um, the advantages at that scale are interesting. Yeah, it, it sounded good. It sounded like you're right to all, however many drives you have in your VDEV at once instead of just one. Um, yeah. yeah, you no, can see the, from the that output. You also do normally inside your VDEV, but you have a giant VDEV instead mm -hmm. of one per JBot, basically, instead of one uh, per group of parity. Mm -hmm. So it's basically the, uh, the question is basically a 2D matrix versus a 1D matrix. And because it doesn't dynamically stripe, uh, yeah, you can do that and you can re basically resilver a broken disk from every disk. So if one disk fails, normally what ZFS has to do is it has to basically go through the history of a pool and apply the scan through the allocation groups and then reapply the blocks which are supposed to be on that device into the right location. Um, which, um, at least in an all flash array, is not not that much of a problem from the ARPS point of view, but it's a problem uh, that it takes a while and only the drive inside the same way, let's say Z2 or Z3 are involved in the rebuilding process. And they see a lot of kind of random misreads in this situation. So, and you don't have the redundancy. With uh, D-Rate during rebuild, you really can go through the whole disk and the, maybe you, because it's sharded across, you can rebuild with several gigabytes a second without impacting pool performance. Uh, feel free to prepare a D-Rate presentation for a future call. That would be awesome yeah. because it's a new technology potentially of, of importance as block cloning. The and downside that is that um, <laughs> the, really because you don't have verbal sized stripes, every little write now takes a full stripe. Hmm. So that can mean a very large write amplification. And the solution to that is uh, to have a different kind of VDEF in your pool, probably a uh, double or triple mirror for the metadata uh, and s log and then you get good performance for large files in very large pools yeah I, I think you can see from the output that i pasted earlier about our file size and most of our stuff's over um 512k hmm. yeah, the majority yeah, of it's in between uh, one meg and 500 megs. But I just yeah, want to ask you, um, uh, Jan, uh, if I'm hopefully I'm saying that right, uh, is is D rate something you think that's production ready? Like, has it been out there for a bit? It has been out there for a bit. I've I have one server where I'm testing it on. Uh, mm -hmm. I it's just basically a decommissioned hardware acting as a media backup. Uh, so it's not seeing much load, but it, because I intentionally used very high uh, operating error drives, right? Because I wanted to see errors. Uh, that part worked. I've seen two drives die. I have another one uh, producing IO errors, but admitting to it quickly. So that regard, it's perfectly reliable. I could take the virtual spare and recover the pool and. It, Perform beautifully for that, hmm. uh, but it's true that the metadata operations are slow on a disk of, uh, in this case, forty something spinning disks. Um, okay. For that, you want somewhere else to, for the metadata to go. So, mirror of uh, even SATA SSDs is good enough to keep up with lots of spinning old rust if you only write the metadata. The important part is write latency uh, and IOPS, of course. Interesting. But, 
Thank you. And you really have to think at it because you're locking yourself into this pool layout, how much redundancy you want. Uh, but the advantage is basically that you can use the full JBot's internal bandwidth to resilver because resilvering now really is just calculate the parity and do it using sequential read write. So you can have a short QDAP of one or two uh, outstanding operations per disk and still resilver with like 100 megabytes per disks per second. Hmm. And you're limited by the sequential write performance of the new disk as to how fast you can resilver. Interesting. And the other drives are also only loaded with sequential reads during that. So, yeah, I'm gonna the have, impact. I was gonna say, I'm just gonna read up on it a little more. I um, it sounds really super interesting, and and I hope that it works. It's just I'm trying to sell the company on, you know, going down the ZFS mm -hmm. road instead of proprietary storage and. I wouldn't want to get mud on my face by hitting some yet to be discovered bug with D RAID. So I think In that I might. Case, be, um, yeah. you I'm with to, you there. Yeah, yeah. surely. Uh, RAID Z3 is the true and tested way to go. Right, right now. Yeah, I'm using... the, uh, outside of overcautious when it comes to provisioning redundancy and spare drives. Yeah. Yeah, so but, so we we have spare drives, and I'm using ten device uh, RAID Z groups. And the thinking there was that it sort of fits nicely with the eight bits and two parity. So. Yeah, that's one of the nice things. Exactly, if you go in powers of tools of data, the same also applies with D RAID. But with D RAID again, you can say basically, I want to have stripes of this size of data, this size of parity. And then that should be a multiple of the number. Uh, uh, the number of drives in the pool should then be a multiple of that. And so, those were firm rules before LZ4 compression. Um, but I thought that would apply to uh, RAID Z2 for 10 drives because it's eight. Um, yeah, RAID data. Z2 with 10 drives has the property that you get basically an eight times logical block size, yeah. so 4K times eight as your full stripe width so that you get a full 4k block on each data drive and two parity uh, 4k blocks in it too so. so that means that you basically have now 42k as the smallest full stripe so you two raised an interesting question there which is you know no production user wants to get egg on their face by finding something like a oh, uh, block dedu block cloning bug but enterprises have to be super cautious but we're talking open source software with open source vendors and we do have you know storage vendors like you know the more open ones be it iX systems testing the heck out of it hopefully on our behalf but how do a bunch of us volunteers on a call prototype a multi jpod multi petabyte production ish workload with like zero budget that's sort of a yeah. an academic that's question i've been trying to solve for 20 years and i'm not yet quite <laughs> there that's one and that's one of the things michael i try and do with my new my new builds yeah appreciate it customers and we it's like okay now i can test it for a couple of days one it exercise the drives and then i go back to put our normal application on it so i'm cheating well, it are there tools that would be helpful? You know, I know there's like a developer ZFS test suite, but what, you know, should you be able to just reach for a standard test and say, okay, it, it passes the uh, Kobayashi manure, or whatever they called it. Um, You're not supposed to pass that. Oh, right. Sorry. Um, it's a no-win scenario. It's a no-win scenario. Like open source software. Uh, <laughs> free and oh, yeah so anyway um, i'm all ears on what resources yeah. would be helpful and, or just i wish vendors would 
have an uh, you know, larger users would have an avenue to get join calls and share their wisdom and share their output. And John, you've absolutely shared some gems over the coming the last few months. And yeah, so just please don't be don't keep it secrets because we're we can't read your minds out here. Mm. And yeah, you don't want something else it. I wanted to uh, and I can easily try out is a triple parity pool with the drives shared across dual uh, upstream ported uh, JBots. Yeah. So that you can have a dual head Z pool with uh, potentially automated failover. But to make that scale, you need an Optinium dead end hardware like uh, SCSI uh, switches, which uh, aren't real common. And yeah, because if you do it in software using iSCSI or something, uh, you have other bottlenecks long before you reach uh, the theoretical limits of such a design. Really, really what it comes down to, and this is, it's anytime you're looking at it, take three steps back and act like a consultant. That what? gets. If you act like a consultant saying, okay, I, I'm making no assumptions about my about Greg's enterprise. I know it's you know it's media and entertainment. Okay, great. I know it's got security issues. I you know, I know these are the relative file type sizes, quantities, number of users, all that kind of jazz. Now, what is the risk appetite for the company? That's the biggest question to answer. What's you the think. risk what? Appetite, you said? Risk appetite. Okay, I like that. Well, I, I'm also a security and audit guy, so that's one of those things that's brand in. Okay, if you're willing to accept the risk, put your money where your mouth is. If you're not, you're going to be putting your money into somebody else's insurance policy. Yeah. Um, yep, something to get a better model is also to basically ask what can you risk? Can you risk losing the whole pool? Can you risk a week of downtime while you move yeah. to other hardware if some component fails and it's not in stock and you have to find something else? Uh, can you not suffer any downtime other, more than a few minutes and you have to keep synchronous replication of all your rights? Uh, yeah, extreme well, cases, if there, but. Yeah, across geographies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good luck with that. Synchronous <laughs> replication across uh, I, disaster I, uh, zones is. Uh, I I don't dis I do not disagree on, but people have that kind of expectation because of marketing people. Hmm. Yes, yeah, they do. but if you want to get acceptable throughput and latency with Geographic wide area replication, you have to do it at the application layer to minimize round trips. You can't do it at the block level. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. We um we have a 10 gigabit link to our uh, offsite data center, which is about two blocks away. Um, and we we uh, replicate. So every night I uh, replicate the ZFS that's going to be our production server over to another zfs uh, server mm -hmm. so that's that's how we're taking or that's how in my mind i'm mitigating the uh, risk of being down for any extended period of time um yeah we'll i'll probably increase that replication when it does go into production i have to see how much it's going to impact performance i'd like um, to do it every hour or so if i could where, where are you at which operating system are you using zfs on uh, the production one that I'm talking about with the Honey Badger cards, that's the Linux and okay. the backup or nearline server that I'm using, that's on the FreeBSD at TrueNAS. Okay. And I'm one in Toronto. One thing uh, you may want to play with to get the replication latency down is instead of just the normal cron jobs, is use something like ZRepo to uh, have quick replicate asynchronous, but frequent replication, then mm. you don't have to be too aggressive because it's basically a background load at that point. And yeah, for, just replicate change blocks from my understanding, yeah. No, it, but it, you don't have to wait for every night. 
if you have the um, IOPS budget that you can afford to and the network bandwidth, if it's a dedicated link mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't fight you for any bottlenecks, you can basically keep the replication running frequently, like every 15 minutes or so. And then we're talking about a very different risk uh, window when you're losing, let's say, half an hour or an hour versus a full day. Um, yeah, I'll uh, I'll take a look. Can at I have the floor well. for it? Can I have the floor for a second, Michael? Oh, absolutely, John, and I'd love to take it too because I want to do a quick little soapbox there. Go ahead, John. Uh, I don't know if this is helpful. I just posted uh, a few minutes ago the chassis that I tend to use for oh, okay, uh, cool. the drives. It's a super micro chassis. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever used this one, but I I would recommend it. Um, and I, uh, Super Micro will configure it in a number of different ways for you. So it's it's more of a you design it and they'll build it. Nice. Um, I believe I actually posted a slide or with you guys feels like years ago, but I'm gonna <laughs> here's the link again. Um, it's an old slide, but it gives the idea. Oh, um, your nifty crisscrossy HA. Yeah, this is what I use for um, the definition of HA. Yep. So on the side uh, are what we, what I refer to as the head nodes um, that provide the NFS protocol or SMB or whatever protocol you're, you're exporting, iSCSI. And you can go anywhere from all the drives belong to one head and the second head is entirely a backup head. So if the first one goes down, you just shoot it in the foot and then bring everything back up on the second head using the IP addresses from the first. Um, and yes, you can use carp and other stuff to, to, to handle this. Um, the other way is you can actually take these drives and you can subdivide them out and you can create one or more pools that live on the first head and one or more pools that live on the second head and then uh, divide out where your resource is coming from on head A or head B. And again, if a head goes bad, you just migrate that export over to the other head and you're on your way. The only thing you need to keep a watch for is if you actually start utilizing over 50% on a continuous basis, your first head, um, and it were to go down, you are you can possibly start slowing things down. Um, as for backing up, we do back this up. It goes to a different unit that looks similar to this. Um, and we do partial backups with a one single full backup per month. Um, I, I don't know if that's useful, but wanted to offer that, uh, for, uh, discussion purposes. Thanks, John. We, we had a similar setup like that. When I first used ZFS, it was about, uh, I guess 10 years ago now. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a company called Nexenta. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it was a horrible experience, but anyway, so I'm, I'm, that's I am familiar yeah um so that's that's who we used uh and we had the fail overheads pretty similar setup to what you're saying just import and export uh we had rsa configured to do that automatically but um yeah you can you can if you use carp um you can actually set up some uh scripting um and when you're when carp sees a, fa a changeover uh you receive an event from dev d um and then you execute a script that will automatically uh, bring your resources online on a on the other head, however you want to phrase it. So it's it's basically fully automated. Be a lot I, cheaper than RSA too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I profoundly admire your trust in the machines to make a, the right decision at that critical point. That's awesome. But I just punched in. I shoot the other things. head in the foot. Well, yeah, I get that. <laughs> so the back side of these things, I. Hey, you manually or control, the automatic niftiness the, does it? These systems use IPMI, yeah. and I can I can literally shut the other head down if yeah. I okay. have a question about it. That's cool. I wouldn't trust just an IPMI shutdown uh, unless I have a PDU as backup. There, Power all, and IPMI. Well, when you do lock files and all that other kind of stuff, we've done for HA for decades 
Yeah. yeah. You I can't uh, use two nodes to form a quorum. You need at least three for that. <laughs> you could, in theory, use SCSI persistent reservations to use your uh, disks as arbiters because you certainly have more than three disks in such a system. So that, in theory, you could have require the master to obtain basically the Chrome among the disks before they get to import the pool. Greenhouse you know, Core does that for their HA. Okay, yeah, it depends with, uh, yeah, SCSI three or higher persistent reservations. But yeah, the, these are the things I would like to play with, but I can't keep a lab environment equipped for that around. Independent wealth would be awesome in these scenarios for testing cool hypotheticals, but then well, real world trench experience is also really helpful. Um, I queued up. I have, num I have a number of these in operation. Uh, from a sufficiently trusted authorship would also be very valuable. Uh, that's kind of the secret source companies for some reason want to keep for themselves. As them, we them, said, we've spent a ton of time and money to do that. And it is a differentiator for the business. Of course it is. I, I'm not blaming them. I'm blaming the state of the world. And <laughs> basically, oh, why can't I, we live in a post-scarcity uh, utopia? I want my enterprise D and I <laughs> think a dedicated HA call would be awesome. I don't mean a separate call, but just Z ZFS and HA is like a, definitely a hot topic. And we almost want to prepare little presentations on what we observe and have success with, and of course, what not to do. Just a thought. What not to do, yeah. try to use a VRP or, um, other things like CARP to have um, automatic failover between two nodes. Oh, uh, I have a tiny soapbox for, to address Greg's replication issues. And may I? Yes. So ZFS is your friend. And there is a written property, which is how much has been written to a given data set or volume since the last snapshot. Yep. And I've yet to see a snapshotting strategy based on that. And I call it the traveling Wilburys problem, which is you have this tiny Tennessee recording studio that's empty 99% of the time of the year. And then you have these like luminaries who are getting old and they come together and re record an album. And that, let's just say weekly snapshot schedule that was set up because the studio is used in like 1% of the year doesn't quite fit the use case of like, oh my gosh, every precious moment with these folks is, well, precious and priceless. So what if we snapshot based on actual written property, say every gig or every three gigs, as opposed to some time schedule, which to me sounds like a developer, not a storage engineer writing the snapshot software. So then if you um, were to snapshot one sec based on written, you would then have a very predictable stream that you're handing over to that second site down the street over 10 gig. There I said The problem is that sometimes uh, volume isn't the important uh, thing, but a single byte change can be very important mm -hmm. as, or a tiny little text file. Um, which you really don't want to lose, like let's say uh, your GPG private key, mm -hmm. and you really don't want to lose that. So what I would recommend instead is to um, snapshot frequently and then look at the taken snapshots. And once you have them locally, decide when to uh, basically, if you have your, let's say, daily replication uh, as your minimum replication rate, but if the local delta gets too large, you uh, insert additional replications, but you still take the snapshots and maybe you discard them if you just notice that they're completely empty. If yeah. there is no difference. I think yeah. you can also see that by looking at the attributes without running through ZFS diff. Uh, yeah, so the you other, have an unmodified- the other, the other part of it, Michael, and this is again, to your specific example, 
is you're talking about a workflow. Mm -hmm. Workflow says, hey, I start my I start off with a fresh snapshot at increments based upon my workflow. This mm -hmm. is where I need snapshots. Here's my final snapshot. And I set my persistence based on that availability and how everything needs to happen versus, hey, I'm running one every 10 minutes for the entire year when I only need what's actually part of that workflow. And if you look at the workflow itself, you just enhance it to say, hey, I take this one extra step at these time intervals or these event intervals. Right. Enhance it indeed. Do... I've seen I've sat down at systems with 20,000 empty snapshots. And it's like we didn't oh, yeah. solve any problems with that. <laughs> right. So uh, yeah. Michael, you're Michael, you're very close. We do something that's kind of both. Oh, I please. generate snapshots every two hours. Okay. But then I go back and I look, and if there's empty snapshots, I just delete them and get okay. rid of them. Fair enough. And that's what I just recommended to prune the empty snapshots. Yes. And you, you prune before replicating just to or, yes. Okay. Yes. Fine. Sounds like an extra uh, step then, that you know we have the metadata to work around, but it's 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 a real easy. Thing. Yeah. But it's also a trust thing too, Michael. It's yep. I trust it. Am I betting my life on that? As Jan said, hey, I need this one bit that got written during this time period while I'm waiting for you know twenty um, more bits to be written. But coming back to workflows, uh, as John mentioned, there's a potential solution. If you allow the user for delegation to take his or her own snapshots, but then have basically the snapshot creation trigger your replication. So basically the user says, okay, I'm done. Uh, I have the golden master of this album or something. Mm -hmm. Now I take a snapshot and your replication software takes over and ensures that there's an offset replication factor of three for this or something. So this taking a snapshot can, I think, be delegated to an unprivileged user so that uh, the workflow can be changed so that basically this becomes part of a handoff between organizational groups or something with some kind of automation. And or ironically, ZFS a, a delegation facilitates that such that an unprivileged user could do something like initiate a yep. snapshot, which is great. Exactly. And the Trinas, user can take a snapshot and the tooling would decide what to do with it. Keep it, replicate it, prune it, whatever. Absolutely. And TrueNAS will replicate whatever it has available. It's checking all the time saying, oh, Someone somewhere made a new snapshot. I'll hand it over. Uh, but that gets back to like when do we actually replicate based on what criteria? Of which they're countless. I'm, I totally get that. <laughs> one of the annoying problems with this uh, pruning of the snapshots, uh, um, asynchronously basically, is that unless you keep bookmarks, you can end up with a situation where you no longer have a common oldest starting point. You have Very true. One, but you no longer have to common the newest shared snapshot, which should exist according to one side of the replications worldview. Doesn't exist of the other way, and that breaks a lot of the older pre bookmark uh, replication scripts, basically. Because Without they, question. And that if could... you use bookmarks, then you can work around that. With like zero overhead basically near zero. Yes, but yeah. well, the overhead is you have to use a tool which makes use of it. Uh, so if you have an old replication script, uh, which has treated you well for a decade, maybe you don't want to get off your old tool no. chain. So you've mentioned ZREPL. There is ZX for that's been around and does the job. Are there any other? I think it doesn't tools? support bookmarks, does like it? Sanoid. Oh, and most of these tools don't support anything introduced in the last five to ten years. So that's my question. Like, what tools are people using? Does. And you know, like Sanoid, San Repl, whatever he's calling it. Go ahead, Jan. What was that? So Z Repl does make use of bookmarks. Oh, it does. Excellent. Yes, it does, and it also. 
supports basically splitting the snapshotting from the replication so you can have different jobs and intervals. Mm -hmm. I'm toying around with it because it looks like it is what I want to have because I'm still on uh, the X and it works for me, but mm. uh, there are things that could be better among others, pruning snapshots. Sure. But yeah, this is not a step you rush into on a production system. Uh, regarding the uh, super chassis you linked to, uh, what are your experiences with the IPMI cards for the JBot chassis these days? Can you power cycle them? If something went wrong, can you make sure that we auto start after power loss? You, you do an MC cold reset every three days, and that keeps keeps IPMI sane. Okay. Um, because yeah, I had years ago. Uh, oh, it says two JBots without them and. After a real power loss, someone has to go there and push the power button, <laughs> which is kind of ridiculous because the uh, documentation left the which jumper uh, enables the auto start on power loss. And if you set the jumper, all your JBots spin up at the same moment, power comes back in the power good sensor Mo in the P. Mo most, of, most of the modern IPMIs and BMC platforms are a hell of a lot better than they were five years ago. Yeah, that's why I asked because I didn't have the opportunity to play with newish uh, super micro chassis. Yeah, super super micro, AIC, Dell, all of them are even HPEs. They are much better than they were previously. AST 2500, every one of them. <laughs> Do they have an NVMe option out of Supermicro yet? Because I know there are some tri-mode JBOTs for those with the budget. The problem with tri-mode HPAs is that they are inherently unable to come even close to the IOPS potential of NVMe storage. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, it's a switch chip and God help you. You know, the problem is the yeah. switch chip is that it's the translation between NVMe and the single Q the uh, HBA mode because they kind of make everything look like it's a su uh, SCSI with a few extensions. So yeah. the HBA isn't just the PCI switch, in which case it would perform, but I it does, does basically convert every protocol it supports into its protocol, which looks a lot like SCSI because it started out as a SCSI plus SATA controller. And thereby, uh, yeah, you have all the SCSI overhead in the driver and then the uh, HPA, which isn't really an HPA, but more like a hardware rate controller, which in pass-through mode. Yeah. And when I had a chance to play with that on someone else's hardware for a few days, uh, yeah, but if you do it like that, you are wasting the potential of NVMe all flash arrays completely. Mm -hmm. You get easy hot plugging support, uh, yeah, it look, you can mix and match, but the problem is that, yeah, you're not getting the performance uh, promises right. of NVMe all flash arrays. Well, back to the independently wealthy and infinite budget to test all these things. Yeah. <laughs> if I can phrase what, what Jan please. said a little bit differently, yeah, I agree please. with him. You don't want to use a, a tri-mode HBA typically. Um, you want to have the NVMe device sitting directly on the bus. Um, at which point you can get all of the I.O. out of it. If it's sitting behind the uh, a, 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 a tri-mode controller, you can only get the maximum throughput that the tri-mode controller uh, card is sitting in, um, in that PCI slot. And that's a 16X slot, no Correct. matter how many NVMe drives you attach. And even then, you're lucky if you max out the slot. Amen. Yeah, uh, that is not really realistic unless you're only doing, I don't know, resilvering a D-rate or something <laughs> um, or reading raw uh, uncompressed data sequentially with lots of readers, but not too many readers. Um, what is not a problem are 
as dumb and cheap as possible cards, which uh, just basically pass through the PCI e signals uh, without compromising signal integrity and almost no logic. The simple 16 to 4 by 4 bifurcation cards. If you have a, a chipset and a BIOS with, or these days EFI, which supports it at all, it works because it's transparent. You just basically treat your slot as four slots and yep. that's it. Um, one of the problems if you have a bu bu big budget and lots of NVMe drives is that you will run out of resources you didn't even know were limited, like uh, message signal interrupts. Because suddenly it turns out that you have, let, let's say, 64 logical cores or even 128 if you're lucky. And then you have 24, 48, whatever, uh, NVMe drives. And every drive wants one submission and one completion queue per uh, CPU core. And that's hundreds of, potentially, if you could have it, thousands of interrupts to be routed, which you can't do, as far as I know, in previously or even in hardware. <laughs> so yeah, you right. run into oh. strange problems where suddenly, if you plug in one more NVMe drive, the system stops booting because uh, it can't initialize the, the NVMe storage. In these mind. cases, you sometimes have to hide them behind stupid adapters. Um, or um, you uh, have to find ways to configure them in such a way that you no longer have a dedicated submission completion queue per core. Yeah, but that's the uh, things which pop up on FreeBSD hackers or current once in a while, that someone mm -hmm. has a new system which is too big. And uh, so oftentimes it's a simple in concept supermicro NVMe optimized storage servers, which then explode in someone's face. And yeah, Linux may get a little bit farther, but not much, because it's really at some point a hardware problem. <coughs> you have to configure the hardware not to exhaust the limited hard limits. <laughs> and yeah, but oh, again, one super that's quick. Just what you can only play with if you have a few hundred thousand dollars worth of hardware in your lab. Yeah. A super quick point, there was mention of multiple namespaces on NVMe devices, but I sure couldn't find an M.2 device with multiple namespaces. There may have been one or two exotic ones, but they're generally a consumer form factor and do not support that. But I would love to have a laptop that lets me boot two OSs from totally different namespaces. Please link a device that will perform that magic if you know of one. I don't know of one in an M.2 form factor. Exactly. I've seen them in U.3. I may not be understanding something that you're saying, but typically a namespace assignment is re also related to the blocking format, et cetera, of the card. It's also a... related to, uh, so you can basically, in some drives, you can see set the claimed physically and sometimes it really changes the on disk layout of the storage so yes that you can yes that you can do that or, or you could uh, potentially change the over commit ratios and stuff like this and which will become more interesting with nvme over fabrics you could use it to basically in at the protocol level, partition a drive so that you can then reassemble the shards and delegate them so that you would chop your NVMe drive into reasonable size namespaces and then reassemble them and export them via NVMe over Fabric to uh, VM hosts, which then get basically direct access to this namespace and the drive firmware is in this situation trusted to do the isolation, but at the lowest overhead you can imagine. Sounds tempting enough that someone will try it. So 
So yeah, um, I'm looking at an M.2 device. I can post some of the output, but I'm I'm always seeing one namespace, but multiple formats. So yeah, the, quite um, a few will do the 512. The and question is not if you see 4K. multiple namespaces, but in smart mon tools, I think you can look up uh, how many namespaces you can create. Uh, almost every drive should ship with one namespace. Yes, the question is, can you create additional ones? Yeah, well, that's pretty much where we're at. Um, uh, dev slash NVMe zero and number, yeah, smart. Mon tools, so number of namespaces one da, 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 da. and so it's yeah not the current number you have to look up the maximum number maximum number well number i'd hope number of namespaces is like maximum um i think you have to yeah create them okay the, oh well, i'm all ears if you've got a workaround <laughs> well, it's not a workaround the drive has to support it yeah. but because 99 point something percent of users want uh, to, yeah. Okay, so I will investigate with that. That's just one namespace you have to create them, I think, and NVMe oh, control oh. may be the tool for that. I'll up arrow to that. Uh, so NVMe control uh, in section eight. It gives me this. Dev list and identify um, number of LBA formats, and that somewhere in there it should tell you. The so I've been routinely number. bumping them to 4K. Uh, you may have to point it at not the NVD device. I know. I get the exact same the, output uh, for the NVMe and S1, and yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the the administration of namespaces probably at the NVMe zero device, not at the namespace one device. Mm -hmm. I've played around with it, and at some point I confirmed that they report as my drives reported at one maximum namespace. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what I've found so, so far. But I'm happy NVMe to be wrong about that one. And S create is probably the command you're looking for. Repeat that. This command. Yep. And that's create. Oh, okay. Oh. I'm speaking. Uh, yeah. Cool. Okay. Anything else? We've covered a lot of good ground. Please do share your amazing ACL discoveries. Will do. Coming back to the NFS uh, group limit, of, at least on oh, right. CBSD, if I remember correctly, you can raise the maximum number of NFS visible groups, and NFS v4 may get you around that entirely. Yeah, I, I pasted that option for uh, oh. earlier on okay. how to do that. Oh, yeah, that's sorry our RPC that. okay. mount D thing. Uh, let me see if I can find it quickly. But, uh, yeah, there it is. I know Let's that it works it. between FreeBSD systems. I don't know if it works with other clients. Yeah, you can do that on Linux. Um, I don't know if what what happened there. Yeah. Cool. I'm sorry. Just oh, don't be sorry. This is yeah, awesome it's... because this is so. This is. This shouldn't be cutting edge, but it's like poorly documented across the board through no fault of any of you. Yeah, you know, it's um I just discovered this when I ran into the 16 group limit, which I hadn't ran into in like a decade. And, right. and I find myself dealing with it again. There it is there. I just pasted it in the chat. So yeah, now I'm not that, sure. If, yeah, the I'm not sure if they all support that, but okay. Yeah. All right. Thank everyone. you, everyone. Have a yep. great remainder of the week. And we're, I'll be around for Beehive tomorrow and Friday on OCI containers because there was a scheduling conflict for a developer. Who's um, just today. quickly, are, are these yeah. notes that you take in the recording, are they posted somewhere so that we can? Absolutely. YouTube.com slash at BeehiveCon, but I'll pretty, pretty bad. I will probably rename that because they are definitely no longer just Beehive related. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thanks. So, yeah.
the document is shared to to Greg. All right. Okay. Cool. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Have a good day, and we'll talk Thank next you. week. Super. Yep. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.